From the upcoming legislative session in Columbia to Dominion Energy to the very latest on the Marvin Gavers case, I speak exclusively with State Representative Peter McCoy Jr. for a special edition of Quintense Close-Ups. And be sure to download the free Quintense Close-Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. And listen to this interview later on the free Quintense Close-Ups iHeartRadio podcast. Happy New Year! Happy New Year. How are you? Quentin, good to see you. Happy New Year to you. Hope you had a good one. Yes, indeed. You know, I ran into you last week right here at the corner of King and Queen Streets, and we had a great discussion. We had a good talk. We sure did. Everything from the Charleston County Republican Party to what you want to do in Columbia to really what's going on with people who are running for offices in, in the political future. Sure. Let me begin with Marvin Gaffers. Okay. Obviously, there's a third lawsuit alleging that he did some not-so-good things with students in Charleston County. Where are you right now with this case in your mind? Quentin, um, you know, this is a situation where the, the school district has really let us down because school is a place for children to go learn, to feel safe, and to be guided by teachers. You know, teachers are, serve such a magnificent role in, in, in children's lives, and to have one take advantage of children and multiple children, to me, is extremely offensive. And where I am mentally with this is that we need some answers. I mean, it's time for us to find out who knew what, why things happened the way they did, and also why this particular man was not fired immediately. But secondly, why was he then given a raise at some later point in time? I mean, to me, it makes no sense because we have actual knowledge right now that the district and that some teachers and that the principal of that school did know about Mr. Gathers and what he was doing. So again, you know, very problematic. How many more questions do you have? I have a lot more questions. And, you know, again, I want to find out who knew what and when they knew what. Because it all comes down to knowledge. It all comes down to information. And if people had information that this was continuing to happen and did happen, and that this man was not immediately fired, there are some major questions in my mind. Not only was he not fired immediately, but again, he was given a raise and promoted. To me, there's a serious, serious issue here because, again, School is a place for children to feel safe and to learn. It's a place for them to grow. It's a place for them to become the people that they're going to be in life. And for this to happen there, it is, is completely offensive. I know a lot of people are looking back to when it really started with this case in 2014. I'm wondering, when would you go back to that? How far would you go back with this particular case? Well, you need to go back as far as you need to. You need to go back to where the actual you know, situation started to happen when the accusation started, when there was actual knowledge of the school district knowing about this, because I know there was communication between gathers um, and the school through letters admitting wrong. And so, I mean, again, you go back as far as you need to. I mean, that's where you need to, we need to find out when these things happen and, ha and who's been affected. Let me turn you to SCNG Dominion Energy. Sure. sure. Obviously that deal has been passed. Sure. As we said it right now, where do we go next? Well, I'll tell you what we need to go next is, you know, you look at the Public Service Commission. Right. Okay, they are the judges in the utility world, and they're the ones who decide whether rate increases happen or whether they don't happen. They're the ones who decide whether the merger with Dominion happens or doesn't happen. And there are some real issues there. You know, when they issued um, their ruling on the Dominion merger and the SEG situation with the rates, you know, one thing that I found to be very problematic is their ruling. They did not find that SCANA acted with imprudence, okay? And to me, we learned nothing for over 17 months but SCANA acting imprudently in their actions um, and what they disclosed and the knowledge that they had of the particular situation. So I have a real problem with that, okay? And I've got a real problem with the, with the PSC for, for not finding imprudence there. I'll tell you what else needs to happen, my, in, in my opinion, next step forward. PSC commissioners are judges. Right now, the ethical rules that apply to PSC commissioners are very lax. They're very slack. And to me, you need to add some serious, some serious ethics um, when it comes to how they handle utilities, how they deal with utilities, what they can accept from utilities. I heard horror stories of PSC commissioners going on trips with utilities, being given meals and paid for meals by, by utilities. And these are the same utilities that come in front of them and ask for rate increases. And to me... There's a huge conflict there, and you got to set up some walls because that's not right. And it's something that I want to take a look at. You talk about these trips and these meals. 
Do they have any leftover money from all of that? <laughs> One thing I will tell you that I did learn um, with this Quentin is that utilities, they have a, it seems to me like an endless pile of money, okay? And, and what they do, what really rubs me the wrong way is that they refuse to put the rate payer first. They refuse to acknowledge the rate payer and the rate payer needs. You look at SCANA and you look at the, the, the situation over 17 months, not one time, not once did they come forward and say, hey, listen, we messed up. Even after the Bechtel report came right. out, right. they didn't come forward one time and say, hey, this is this is wrong. I'm not going to give myself golden parachute bailouts in terms of my retirement packages. I'm going to do what's right for the rate payer. They didn't do that one time. And that's, that, that's very problematic, and it shows where their mindset is. It shows where their heart is, and it shows they're driven by money and not by serving the people of South Carolina. Let me stay in Columbia. You're going to return for your another term, obviously. Yes, sir. As a South Carolina House representative, what should we expect from Peter McCoy Jr.? I'll tell you, um, I have a lot of things that are important to me this upcoming session. I've been fortunate enough to be selected by my peers on judiciary to be the new House Judiciary Chairman, right. which is a huge honor, and, and it's an honor that I take very seriously. But Quentin, when I knocked on doors this past election, and when I talked to people on James Island, Folly Beach, Kiowa, and Seabrook. The concerns were pretty similar, okay? People were talking about education, 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 education reform. Right. They were talking about flooding issues, right. infrastructure issues, and they were talking about, you know, environmental issues when it comes to preserving and protecting our, our beaches and our marshes and also looking at alternative energy sources like solar. Sure. So these things are all on the, on my agenda when we head back to Columbia here and we're going tomorrow. So, you know, I'm very much looking forward to that. You know, Quentin, I've talked to um, a lot of teachers over the past two, actually two or three months um, uh, across the state. My mom, my dad, and my wife were all public school teachers right here in Charleston. And we have a real issue. We have a real problem. I knocked on doors, too, on James Island, and I would knock on doors of teachers, and they would tell me, Peter, listen, I'm renting this house, and I have four roommates because I can't afford to pay rent by myself, and I can't afford to, to pay a mortgage. And to me... Our teachers are the ones that help guide our young children and even grown children through life. I can look back right now at my experience as a student, and I can think of several teachers right now that not only put the time in during the day, okay, for our classroom education, but were also available to me after hours and helped guide me when it came to making college decisions, when it came to making career decisions, or just things that you know I was curious about in life that, that you're coming up as a young child and you want to ask and you want to talk to somebody. You know, your teachers are there for a lot of things. And so being able to keep and retain our teachers to pay them appropriately has to be priority number one. And right now what I talk to as well, a lot of teachers are very frustrated in the oversight that they have. And teachers want to teach. They're worried about filling out reports. They're worried about filling this out and doing, you know, what a, a particular school board may ask of them. You know, teachers need to be allowed to teach without the oversight. That's what they have chosen to do as a profession. So not only giving them the ability to do what they need to do, which is teach, and paying them appropriately, we need to be able to retain good teachers. You know, I've also heard horror stories about teachers in rural counties that they're just not there. And, and so, you know, people are being offered twice the salary to go to rural counties, and they're still turning it down. So we need to be able to keep and retain our teachers and pay them appropriately. Let me turn back to politics. Sure. You know, when we talked on last week, you basically told me, hey, you're very disappointed in the Charleston County Republican Party. And you basically said, hey, we need more younger people in there. Where do we begin with this? You're exactly right, Quentin. Um, I am frustrated with the local Charleston County Republican Party. Charleston County Republican Party needs to get it together. Right now, we have several state house seats, we have countywide seats, and we have positions that are very important to the electorate in Charleston. And our county party is completely ignoring um, the leadership that was there and the lack of help that, that Republicans received in the last election cycle, to me, um, is embarrassing. And where I see a lot of frustration, too, is the Democrats are doing a fantastic job of recruiting younger voters, younger people, and being the big tent party, okay, which means everybody can come in. We want to welcome everybody inside the party. They were active on social media. They were active when it came to going door to door. And the Republican Party in Charleston was nowhere to be seen. 
right now this party needs to concentrate on young people, young voters, bringing in everybody that they possibly can, sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, sharing, you know, positions on how we can help move Charleston forward, how we can help move the state forward. And our party's not doing that here in Charleston. And it's up to the leadership of the Charleston County Republican Party to do that. And right now I'm just not seeing it. How do we help move Charleston and the state forward in your mind? Quentin, um, moving our state forward, in, in my opinion, is, is, is an idea that, that comes from representation of, of, of the people where you, where you live. So where I live right now in James Island, Folly Beach, Kiowa, and Seabrook, you know, I, I, make it a, I make it a hard and fast statement that I represent all people. This is not a, when it comes to me going to Columbia to represent the House District 115, you know, I just don't like to view it as, hey, he's a Republican, he's only going to help Republicans. Or, hey, he's a Democrat, he's only going to help Democrats. When you're elected by the people, you're elected to not only swear to uphold the United States Constitution and the state Constitution, but you're here to move the state forward and to work with everybody. My problem is this. I see a lot of things where people are closed-minded to ideas. They're closed-minded to talking to people. They're closed-minded to meeting with people. And to me, that's where the rubber meets the road. I love nothing more than to go in door to door to people, going inside people's houses and talking to them, whether they're Republican or Democrat, and learning what's important to them. Because that's how you learn how to move a state forward. That's how you learn to work with people, to work across party lines. I'm known for doing that, Brent, and, and I mean that's why I was I was selected by my peers to be chairman of House Judiciary Committee. I work with Democrats, I work with Republicans because when it comes to putting the needs of South Carolina first. I'm tired of the partisan bickering. I'm tired of the partisan fighting. Um, it's time for people to start working together to move the state forward. And, and listen, people will stand on their own ideas, and I respect it. I have my own ideas, too. But it's important for people to be open-minded and learning to work with others. You talk about you being tired of partisan bickering and fighting. You told me also, too, hey, I'm not running for Congress. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We did talk about that yeah. last week. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm very fulfilled and I feel like I'm in a position where I can really help Charleston and really help the district I love and represent. Um, I mean, Quentin, this is the district, House District 115, where I'm raising my children. Right, My children are going to public schools over there right now. And that's where I'm laying my roots is in House District 115. So I feel like that's the best place I can have an immediate impact. So I'm very much enjoying that and I feel like I'm in the place where I need to be. And if I were to interview you for Quentin School Subs in late April, right after the legislative session's over with what would you tell me that you would have accomplished? I'll tell you, we're very lucky because things in the South Carolina legislature don't happen unless your leadership is on board. Okay, when I say leadership, I'm talking about your Speaker of the House, your Majority Leader, and we have fantastic ones in Jay Lucas and Gary Simmel. And those guys have already put through the ranks and they've already told the House membership that priority number one is education. So I get asked a lot, what's going to occupy the legislative session? You know, we're going to get bogged down in issues that don't really matter or bogged down in issues that, that are really not moving our state forward and focusing on major issues like education. And we've already been given that assurance by the Speaker of the House and by the Majority Leader um, in, the, in the South Carolina House that, listen, we're hitting the ground running with education and we're moving forward. So to me, in April when we talk, I want to say, Quentin, we've been able to accomplish major reform with education. We've been able to provide our teachers with much-needed pay raises and that's what I want to talk about in April. State Representative Peter McCoy, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate this. Quentin, thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure to see you. Likewise. Thanks so much for taking the time. Anytime.